Ms. Cheryl Chen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we often hear people saying they want to live long and live well, to age gracefully and successfully. These are common wishes of many seniors as they age. But the irony of ageing is everyone wants to live as long as possible and yet also do not want to live too long because of the various aches and indignities that the old age brings. Personally, I feel we need to view this with a positive light. Ageing may be inevitable, but the key is to understand the process and identify situations early, thereby enabling us to take preventive actions and decide how we wish to age. It is never too early to ask ourselves what we must do to achieve this. A person's state of health is by far one of the strongest determinants in our ageing process. I'm heartened that MOH has widely promoted the need for basic health screening since September 2017 and heavy, heavily subsidised it. While noting that cost and concern about the outcome of the health screening are the main deterrents for many seniors, MOH has made the basic health screening free of charge for our pioneer generation, at very low cost for the CHAS card holders and other Singaporeans. Also, these screenings can now be done at the polyclinics and regular GPs. This move is an encouraging step for many seniors and has been well received. Many seniors whom I've met in Fengshan have told me they have since undergone the health screening. Follow-through actions post-health screening is also another key area that is neglected by many seniors. We need to encourage them to understand how to better care or to improve their conditions in certain areas. In Fengshan, we are thankful for the support of MOH in establishing the community health post for this purpose. Now, our seniors can have individual coaching sessions and from the healthcare professionals to take charge of their health and to improve on it. While these efforts are laudable, they are not preventive. The way for preventive action is, of course, to maintain a healthy and active state from young. Since last July, we have worked with HPB and Active SG to introduce weekly exercises within the neighbourhood. My residents are excited with the variety of exercises that's available every day, from Monday through Sundays. Our young working adults now can also enjoy and exercise with us. For the retirees and seniors, there are day exercises for them too. Seeing our seniors, working adults, children and grandchildren all in tow participating, I'm cheered by the overwhelming response. This is a head start for our busy working adults and it is a actually good start for the journey. I remember one of the residents who told me she's glad to be on this journey with us now. She said, and I quote, it's best to do so before one's body becomes stiff and weakens. When a person is affected by illness, even the most willing heart will be demotivated to exercise. And I totally agree with her. My concern is, will HPB or Active SG continue this on the long run? Are there sufficient trainers to conduct these sessions? I urge MOH to consider supporting and enhancing this great initiative. MOH can consider collaborating with PA, private organisations and freelancers on training or to train our community interest groups in order to sustain a wider pool of trainers for future. While these sessions are free of charge, the impact it has on the community and the country will be lasting. After all, prevention is better than cure. Furthermore, funding such initiatives will come at a small price compared to the subsidies that's required for the medical bills and also more medical infrastructural expansion. Apart from health programs, community involvement is pertinent for broader awareness outreach and having our seniors to be constantly engaged. I trust that we are doing so in different ways on the ground and will further enhance these areas over time. Meanwhile, let me raise four aspects related to ageing that I would like to highlight for the ministries to review. First, to increase the MediSafe limit usage on outpatient treatment for seniors that's aged 70 years old and above, those with chronic illness but has met their basic health care sum. I understand the current position is to decide the appeals on the usage for case-by-case -case basis. However, I would like to ask MOH to reconsider and put in place a rule for higher limit utilisation for those seniors who fulfil the BHS and their MediSafe and or minimum sum in the retirement account, particularly if they do not use this for their annual scans or diagnostics. 
During my house visits and dialogue sessions, seniors have expressed the same request to use more of their Medisave funds for the outpatient medical fees instead of using their cash or for their spouse to top up their funds as they are also elderly. Take the example of a 73-year-old resident of mine who is diabetic and has a heart condition. He shared that he needs to be on permanent medication to manage his health condition. With only $400 allowed to be used from his Medisave for outpatient treatment, he needs $800 out-of-pocket cash for his regular medication each year. But he still has over $55,000 in his Medisave account. By simple math, he recounts that his Medisave funds will way outlive him. Instead, the larger risk for him is if he cannot afford the regular medication to manage his conditions and thus result in complications. To him, his Medisave funds will be worthless if he dies from diabetes or heart attack. For chronic patients like him, I think being able to use their funds freely and at ease will be a huge relief as they need not worry about the cash outlay for requisite medications that sustain their lives. Second, to promote and encourage seniors to make a lasting power of attorney or LPA by age 55. From the well-being of the Singapore Elderly Study in 2015, it showed that by 2030, one in 10 Singaporeans aged 60 and above are likely to suffer from dementia. That is an estimated 80,000 seniors who may have dementia in their golden years. Early protection is beneficial to both the seniors and their caregivers. Everyone would wish to live their lives in their preferred way and be given a choice. However, many seniors are not aware of the benefits of LPA and how to go about it. I know that in order to encourage more Singaporeans to prepare to protect their interests, the Office of Public Guardian has extended the LPA application fee waiver for two years till 31st August 2018, at least for those filing the LPA Form 1. We should maximise this opportunity to bring the LPA certificate issuers together with the community as we concurrently outreach and communicate about elderly programmes or schemes for our seniors. This will be useful for many seniors, especially in Singapore where couples are usually co-owners of the property. It can prevent situations where elderly wish to downgrade or monetize their property to support expenses but unable to do so due to the mental state of their spouse. Similarly, LPA will allow the seniors to decide in advance on their preferred palliative care if they do require it someday. Third, caregiver support. Respite care available today is scarce and relatively high in cost. We would hope that care support begins with the family and each would take their part in the effort to provide the needful relief for the caregiver. While the thought is good, caregivers in reality face different challenges in the, even in their keenest desire of taking a break. Many say this is where community involvement should begin. I say it's yes and no. Yes, to the extent that we can find community befrienders and match them to those to provide relief for caregivers and give them some time off. No, as there are other considerations that need to be in place. One example is how do we protect the befrienders and the beneficiary as the person to be cared for has different engagement and mental state? Can the families entrust their loved ones and the home to a stranger for a period of time? What is the basis of understanding on the task that a befriender is supposed to undertake, or for that matter, not be, to be taken advantage of? As a start, I would ask the Ministry to consider partnering with senior daycare centres within each neighbourhood. Once a month, make the centres available on a Saturday or Sunday for those caregivers who wish to place their seniors for a few hours at the centres. At the same time, we can introduce community befrienders to these centres, with the presence and support of centres trained professionals, the befrienders can help to care for the seniors. This would be a known, safer environment and provides assurance for all the parties. We can also consider having caregiver support network at the same location to give caregivers the opportunity to share experiences, talk amongst themselves, or even to offer free volunteer care services like hair service, massage, healthy meals prepared for these caregivers who usually have no time for themselves. 
Another option is to manage this through a knowledge-based approach and central management system to match the needs. To work with nursing homes or daycare centres to provide the respite care for a few hours at subsidised rates. I ask that MOH consider the subsidies not only by household means testing, but to include consideration for whether alternative affordable health caregiver option is indeed available given today's smaller family units. And lastly, conscious planning and integration of housing with senior-friendly infrastructure. We often talk about ageing in place. This can only happen with conscious planning both infrastructures and programmes. We need to consider integrating housing for seniors within the community. Back in 2016, together with the PAP Women's Wing, we made a study trip in Hong Kong. One of the projects we viewed was an area where the public housing flats of senior studio apartments were integrated with the regular public housing of the two- and three-room flats for the seniors staying on the same floor. Within the same building, this makes it less of a retirement village and enables the elderly to be constantly engaged by immediate neighbours with younger families living nearby. HDB could consider if moving forward, we can build the two-room flexi short lease flats within the same building, constituting three or four-room flats. This can enable the three-gen families to purchase units next to one another and encourage stronger family units, or allow better social mix where the younger families can look out for the seniors next door. I also encourage MND to plan having town audits throughout Singapore to ensure that the basic amenities and the designs fulfil the needs to support an ageing population. For the mature estates, to consider giving guidance on how we can better refit the amenities to suit the growing needs. This will be beneficial in the long haul and save substantial spending when the final designs are constantly constructed with a senior-friendly state in mind. In closing, Mr. Spe Deputy Speaker, I want to draw reference to a book titled The Colours of Ageing by Professor Kwa Hee Hyo. The colours in his book's title represents the hope, will and the imagination of an undefeated mind, which is, in my view, as crucial if not more to living with one's faculty intact. In order to have an undefeated mind and be physically healthy in our golden years, this requires proactive actions from early on. I think this motion is timely. From personal intervention, prevention to social activeness, senior-friendly townships to social care networks, it is time we begin to work cohesively as a community towards achieving a country of vibrant seniors whom we treasure and they who can live their golden years in comfort. I strongly support the emphasis for us to begin doing more as a nation towards this goal and together we will and can become sprightly seniors.